welcome you, um, Dr. Breyer, to this interview. It's the first interview for the book about um, the moving of the Luxa obelisk. And i um, very grateful to have you here. Um, I just wanted to ask you a few questions. Um, I think the first question is about the translation, um, the Apollinaire Labas translation from French to English. Yeah. Could you let me know a little bit about why you actually began to uh, come to this particular project um, what drew you to it, and a little bit about uh, the translation itself. Oh, sure, sure. Um, the reason I did the book was, you know, I'm not a translator, really. It's the first book I've ever translated. Um, and the reason I did it was about three or four years ago, maybe five, I did a book called Cleopatra's Needles, which was yes. about the three obelisks that were moved in the 19th century to Paris, London, and New York. And I, of course, had to research them, and I was studying all the different obelisks. And when I read the uh, account, Apollonia Labar's account of, of the obelisk, I thought it was remarkable. He's a remarkable man, and he, it was a remarkable achievement, and nobody knew the story. You see, the London obelisk was in all the newspapers of the time. You know, the London Illustrated News copied it, and there were books about it, and everybody knew the story. The New York yes. obelisk, the same thing. It came, you know, in the newspapers, and Gorringe who moved the obelisk. But with the Labar, which was the first one that left in, in the 19th century, 1834, with Labar, nobody knew the story because he published it in his own book, but it was published by this very small government press. Nobody ever saw it. It went out of print quickly. It's a rare book, and it had never been translated. So I thought this is a story that people really should know about, and that's why I did the translation because I really thought it was just a, a great story, and I came to love Labar, so I just thought everybody should know about it. So the book really isn't mine. It's Labar's. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm reading it at the moment, as you know, Bob, and um, I'm very impressed by the translation and by the readability of it. Um, is that because of the way in which you have translated it, or is it almost a transliteration, is, is what I'm asking? No, it's Labar. It's Labar. He has a wonderful style about him. Um, he's a, yes. real, he's a real human, human being, and he cares about people, and he writes very simply, and he, and he puts his emotion into it. So it's really all Labar. And I didn't have to, it wasn't the kind of translation that one struggles with, you know, where the syntax is terrible, he's awkward, he can't phrase things. You know, you just let Labar speak and it's just fine. So it's his voice that comes through. So I, I basically wanted to also know what you thought about the production of the book um, that has come out or was coming out on the 9th of March. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, one of the things about Labar that was important was he was one of the, the the first people who really knew what he was doing. What I mean by that is, before Labar, when people moved an obelisk, they didn't know how much force was required to lower it, pull it from a pedestal. They didn't know how much force was gonna be on the ropes or how much friction, but Labar went to the Ecole Polytechnique. So he was a trained engineer and was the first one who really knew what he was doing. Um, if you compare the other obelisk move before his, his is 1834, but the, the other big obelisk move before that was the Vatican obelisk, you know, 1585 by, by, by Fontana. And Fontana had no idea what he was doing. You know, he had 100 capstans with men turning winches and doing this. He didn't know how much force he would need, so he threw everything at it. Labar did the calculation and said, I don't need 100 capstans, I need 10. So Labar was an engineer who knew what he was doing. So this is to, all to answer your question about the production of the book. He also was trained in drafting. He could do beautiful drawings, and he did, of the obelisk being moved in the various stages. So I wanted these to be produced you know, nicely in a book, and AUC Press did just wonderfully. Um, also, I had a friend, William Joy, who's an expert on computer graphics, and he did all the graphics for me on, on taking Labar's drawings, heightening them. So the book is really beautiful. It's oblong shape because the, the diagrams are quite long. So I'm very happy with it. AUC Press did just a great job. I would have to agree with that because I've been looking at the actual um, diagrams as well as some of the other pictures and um, it, they're very clear, very precise and, and beautifully done. Um, yeah, so yeah. I would really agree with that. Good. Now the actual story itself, I'm quite impressed with the way it, it moves because although it's a diary of the time of moving that obelisk, it's not a dry um, engineer's account um, it's more of a story. It's moving, and it's um, it has 
troughs and it has peaks. It, it, it's like it's reading like an adventure story. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think you've got it right on. Um, you know, when you read the other t- accounts of the other two obelisks, of Gorringer's account of moving the New York obelisk, or Wayneman Dixon's account of moving the London obelisk, you don't get the people. You know, these guys weren't interested in Egypt. They were engineers who were just going to grab their obelisk home, and that was it. That was their job. Quick and dirty, done that, and it's over. Lebas really took time to get to know the people. Um, for example, you know, he hired lots of locals in Luxor, and these were people who were really, really not used to seeing outsiders being you paying them. He actually paid them and he, and he paid them a fair wage. And even, for example, he, he mentions and not to brag, but he just mentions that a blind woman came when he put out the said, I need workmen. He, a blind woman came and said, I can't really work, but I can pray for you. And he paid her, yes. he hired her and paid her, you know, so he was really a great guy. And, and he and he and he went on an adventure. He went into Nubia. You know, he went south of the first cataract past Aswan. He wanted to see that he went all the way to Abu Simbel. 1834, yes. no tourism there. And, and he describes it all. So I thought he was a really wonderful guy. And, and it really gives you a sense of almost like an Amelia Edwards travel a thousand miles up the Nile or something like that. He's really into the people just as much as he is into the obelisk. Yes, I, I think that that's um, another aspect to the book, which I'm really enjoying, um, which is that it's not just about the moving of the obelisk, although that's there. Um, yeah. The diagrams and the precision is, is all there. But it's about the people, about um, Egypt in the 1830s or coming up to the 40s. I think he wrote this in 1839. Yeah. But yeah. I think what what I love about A Thousand Miles Up the Nile is, uh, you know, the description of Egypt at that time. And this has got the same type of detail. Um, I was quite uh, amazed by the way the workmen, for instance, were moving that obelisk and um, just the way in which they were working, which is not the way in which one would work now. Um, So I think that that type of human detail is what readers will also gravitate to as much as um, to the the actual details of moving this obelisk, which is an engineering feat in itself, I think. Yeah, I think so. I think it's it's really an an entrancing story. Um, And he also, you know, he, he had drama. There was drama. For example, I mean, this is something that, you know, even Egyptologists don't know. France was given three obelisks. He was actually given the ob- both both obelisks at Luxor and one at Alexandria, and he and he was yes. he was tasked to bring them all bring all three back, you know. And this he couldn't do that. I mean, it was impossible. But what happened was a ship arrived at Alexandria to take an Alexandrian obelisk, and they couldn't get it down. They didn't have enough wood. They hadn't come prepared. They thought Egypt had wood, which it didn't. So there's all kinds of drama in here. And another thing is that, you know, he was taking the obelisk that Champollion said was the better of the two at Luxor. Champollion said, if you're going to take one of the obelisks, take the one on the right, because it's the one that's not, you know, cracked, that's really in great shape. And when he arrived there, he was shocked. It was cracked. that had a big crack through the through the base. And he was really worried about it. You know, he said, my God, if I break this thing when I lower it, what's going to happen? So he was really worried. So it's a story also with plenty of drama and plenty of excitement, you know, and Egyptological details that nobody knows about. Yes, I, I can relate to the worry um, because he, he, I think he goes on about the worry that he has over the crack for almost two chapters. Yes. It, it's coming up all the time. And I thought it would just be for one page, but I think it's a very human thing, um, especially when you're engaged in some type of work, to worry um, or, or try to work something out. And yes. I think the way they describe that, or the way he describes that, is um, very interesting, and it adds to that human element. Um, so it's not just about moving the obelisk, but about what it takes to, to do something like that as well. Yes, yes. And, and then they had real problems with, with wood down even in Luxor, because he came with his ship, the Luxor, which they were going to put inside, inside it. And what, what happens is they ran, they ran out of wood. They didn't have enough wood to, once they brought the obelisk down, they needed a slipway to, you know, and they just didn't have any wood. And what they finally had to do to get the thing on the ship was cut off the front of the ship. They cut the front of the ship off, slid the obelisk inside, and then reattached it because they didn't have the wood necessary to open the ship and repair it. So there were all kinds of problems. Um, and, you know, I mean, one of the things I love about Levi is that he's a techie. I mean, he's a human. He cares about the people. But he's a real techie who can do the calculations and the science. 
And yes. one of the little known facts that you haven't gotten to because you haven't finished the book, I know, because, you know, but one of the little known facts that, that I was shocked with was when he finally gets it to the Place de la Concorde and he's going to erect it in France. He tries to do it with a steam engine. Nobody had ever tried anything like that. The steam engine had been used mainly for, for railroads. But on land, they still hadn't realized the great you know, function of a steam engine, how good it could be. And he tried it, but they gave him a defective boiler and he couldn't get up enough steam, literally enough pressure to raise the obelisk. So he went back to the capstans. You know, all right, guys, we're going to use our 10 capstans and we'll use the winches and we'll winch it up. But he tried with a steam engine, which is quite something. I mean, quite a guy. It is. It is. It is. Well, I'm, I'm really enjoying the book and I've read your other books as well, um, Bob. Um, I was just wondering, um, you seem to be very interested in obelisks. I know that you've given many lectures on, on obelisks yeah. as well, which I've yeah. enjoyed. Um, and I was just wondering if there was a, a reason. Is it the elegance of the engineering or is it, is it just something that interests you as a perhaps someone who's interested in mathematics? And um, it's, it just seems to be a reoccurring theme for you. It, it is well spotted. Uh, you're right. It, it is a reoccurring theme. Um, for me, I think obelisks are almost as amazing as the pyramids. I think they're just and such an engineering marvel that I'm, I'm just astounded by, by everything about them. I mean, for example, you know, of course, they're all a single piece of granite. All the obelisks, big obelisks are granite because that's the only stone that could support the weight. Um, but they're pounded out of the quarry, you know, with these balls of stone, very difficult. And then you have to move them. And you've got all these guys hauling on ropes, moving obelisks, and then you have to erect it, you know. And I, th I just think it's heroic that these guys would tackle these things, that the ancient Egyptians would attempt that. With a pyramid, it's really just get a stone, move it, get another stone, move it, and you do it a couple of million times and you've got it. With an obelisk, sometimes they're really just just astounds me how, how they did it. Or, for example, the only account we have of raising an obelisk or moving an obelisk is at Deir al-Bahari, Hatshepsut's mortuary temple, where on the wall she shows they're moving her pair of Karnak obelisks. And what yes. amazes me is they move both of them on a single barge. They're end to end. You have two obelisks. You know, you have 230 tons next to each other. I would move them one at a time but not the Egyptians. They put them end to end. So obelisks really fascinate me because of the engineering of it. They're just remarkable. Yes. Um, well, I know that uh, I've traveled with you as well, Bob, and it's been <laughs> yes, uh, <get> wonderful. <laughs> um, I don't know. I know that you're in lockdown. We've actually just gone into lockdown this morning. Um, so mm. are you planning on, on traveling to Egypt or taking a group with you? Um, you've probably been asked this before, um, anytime in the future. Yeah, we, we are planning already. Um, we're, we're, I wouldn't say optimistic. We're, we're, we're cautious. Um, we have a trip planned. I believe it's for October, October. And um, I think we'll be OK as long as everyone on the trip is vaccinated. See, I'm, I'm very conservative. Um, the yes. virus yes. is quite bad in Egypt. It, it, it's bad. And I don't think we have accurate numbers. I don't think even the Egyptians know how many people have it, you know, or anything like that. But I think if everybody on our trip is vaccinated, we'll be just fine. So I think yes. by October, we'll be able to go quite safely. We also have small groups, large bus, we spread out. But if we're all vaccinated, we can all hug and kiss if we want. But, but I think we'll be <laughs> fine in October. And that's about the, for the beginning of it. Well, Bob, it's been fantastic talking to you. Um, I'm really enjoying the book. Thank you for this interview. I know that it's uh, one of the first to go out and um, I know that we'll be talking as well. So thank you very much for your time and um, I hope that you stay safe. <laughs> you too. All right. Just... Thank you. Bye.